let's begin with Plato's Allegory of the Cave. It's a passage from Book 7 of his Republic, and it is, in my view, the most important passage in the history, at least of Western philosophy, if not of all philosophy. And it's certainly the most important passage that I'll discuss in this podcast. It condenses all of Plato's lessons into a story, and he's written it ingeniously not only to do that, to condense all those lessons into one short story, but to write a story that once you hear, you can never forget. So I've had people who are in their 60s and 70s when they find out I'm a professor of philosophy and that I teach Plato in particular come to me and say, oh, the cave, and then remember a few details from this. And Plato's clearly done that deliberately, that because the lessons of his philosophy are condensed into the story, I think he's confident that this story, because it will stick in your memory and will churn there uh, throughout your life in one way or another, as we'll see, that the lessons of his philosophy will be churning in your mind as well. So let me begin with the beginning then of Book 7 of the Republic, offering a commentary as I go. Next, then, says Socrates, compare the effect of education and that of the lack of it on our nature to an experience like this. He's going to go on to describe the experience being this, this cave that we'll get into. But first that sentence, compare the effect of education and that of the lack of it so this is a story about education and what it's like to have a good education versus not having a good education. So first of all, it's a story about education. Compare the effect of education and that of the lack of it on our nature. Secondly, a story about who we are. What is our nature as human beings? And he wants us to compare education and its effect on our nature to an experience like this, namely this allegory of the cave. The next sentence begins imagine. And that's crucial. Uh, that word will come up several times uh, in today's episode as I read this. Plato's deliberately signaling that the story is not an argument. Philosophers cherish arguments, certainly those in the American tradition and the English tradition, um, premises and conclusions, valid deductions, and so on. And there are those in Plato. But Plato is a master artist as well as a philosopher in that narrow sense of constructing valid arguments. And he writes stories of the kind of power I mentioned earlier. And he's aware that those stories come to us not through analytical reason, but through our imagination. And so he's appealing here directly to our imagination. So the second sentence begins, imagine human beings, in other words, us, living in an underground cave-like dwelling with an entrance a long way up that is open to the light and as wide as the cave itself. So you begin to hear about these people and you think, oh, they're these cave dwellers. You know, why in the world are they living in caves? He tells you in the next sentence, they have been there since childhood, so they've never left this cave. Why in the world would they never leave a cave? Well, as he goes on to write, with their necks and legs fettered. So they're prisoners, these human beings in this cave. Who's keeping them there and for what purpose? He goes on, so that they are fixed in the same place, able to see only in front of them because their fetter prevents them from turning their heads around. So these poor prisoners, it's of course impractical, impossible that from childhood they would be in the same chairs, fettered, unmoving their entire lives but it works as an imaginative story that they're trapped. And as we'll go on to see, they're not trapped against their will because the people who are trapping them uh, create a show for them on the wall in the cave in front of them that fools them into thinking this is what life is like. Light is provided by a fire burning far above and behind them. Between the prisoners and the fire, there is an elevated road stretching. And it helps, by the way, if you have a pencil and pen, just to draw a diagram of this as it goes. So far we have the prisoners who've been there since childhood fettered into chairs. The chairs are facing a wall and behind them is an elevated road and behind the road is a fire. So the fire is casting light across the road towards the wall that's in front of the prisoners. 
Between the prisoners and the fire, there is an elevated road stretching. Imagine, there it is again, Plato, who is not uh, a repetitive writer, who knows the importance of varying his vocabulary, is choosing deliberately to say imagine twice in the same paragraph. Imagine that along this road, a long wall has been built. Like the screen in front of people that is provided by puppeteers and above which they show their puppets. So who are these shadowy figures? Literally, they're in the shadows of the fire and they're behind this wall, uh, walking an elevated road. And they're like puppeteers. In fact, we're going to see there they are puppeteers of a sort. So that was all Socrates speaking. That's the first paragraph of Book 7 of the Republic. And this dialogue, as so many of Plato's, is a conversation between Socrates and at least one other person whom we call generally the interlocutor, the person with whom Socrates speaks. Sometimes there are several in a, in a dialogue, as in this case in the Republic, but there's one in particular who keeps appearing, and that's Glaucon, who happens to be Plato's brother. He gets the next line, which is very short, and he says simply, I am imagining it. Again, the word imagination. Socrates begins again. Also imagine then that there are people alongside the wall carrying multifarious artifacts that project above it. Those are the people likened uh, a moment ago to the puppeteers. They're walking alongside that wall so that their uh, forms are hidden from the people in the chairs. And of course, the people in the chairs can't turn around to see them in the first place because they're fettered there. But what it means to have a wall is that the fire doesn't cast the shadow of these puppeteers onto the wall. All that's cast is the shadow of the puppets, so to speak, or the statues, whatever it is they're parading uh, atop that wall. So multifarious artifacts that project above it, namely statues of people and other animals made of stone, wood, and every material. And as you would expect, some of the carriers are talking and some are silent. So this movie that they're creating, uh, and I, I choose movie deliberately, uh, not until uh, we had movies, you know, within the last century and a half or so, have we had a direct parallel to uh, what uh, Plato was imagining in this allegory 2,500 years ago. And we have, of course, silent movies and then eventually talking movies. And he's saying these are talkies, that the puppeteers are carrying the statues and so on and not just creating a shadow play on the wall in front of the prisoners, but also they're talking. And that is, when they carry a human statue, they're going to mouth words for the people. And when they carry animal statues, they're going to imitate the sounds of animals. And the whole point is to create a movie on the wall in front of the prisoners. As I said uh, a moment ago, these prisoners are going to grow up, because they've been there since childhood, under the illusion that this is what life is like, because it's crucial that they know nothing else since birth. If you can imagine it, they've been trapped there and knowing nothing else, they take this show to be real. It's not that they look at it and say, this is real, because that would imply that they could question it and say it's not real, or they'd have some idea of what uh, alternative there is. Rather, they, they're kept in a state of suspended animation, if you like, their imagination is suspended. Uh, or rather, their imagination is active. Their rational uh, faculty, their ability to question the reality of what they're seeing, that's being suspended by the ingenuity of the puppeteers who are creating for them this illusion of reality that they, the prisoners, take to be real without even asking whether it's real or not. Glaucon then says, it's a strange image you are describing and strange prisoners. Strange. The word in Greek is atopon, um, without a place, topos is place, and alpha or a is uh, the negative or the privative. So we would say unplace, uh, non-place is the word for strange. And this non-place, this place that doesn't exist, the cave, is uncanny. It's strange because not simply that it's imaginary, but there's something familiar about it, Plato thinks. Plato's... Uh, encouraging us to imagine. And so what is it that's familiar about this story for us, even though there's never been such a place and we've never had any experience quite like that? What is it saying for us? Socrates short circuits that um, 
comment that this is strange, that this is no place, that this is unfamiliar, and Socrates says next, they are like us. What in the world can that mean? Who listening has uh, been trapped in a cave since birth, has been fettered there, has been shown uh, a shadow play as if it were real and so on? Nobody. So how in the world are they like us? He goes on. I mean, in the first place, do you think these prisoners have ever seen anything of themselves and one another besides the shadows that the fire casts on the wall of the cave in front of them? This is quite a subtle point, and it's difficult to explain uh, merely with my voice. I, I like to draw diagrams whenever I can. I guess I've already encouraged you to use a pencil and paper to draw it for yourself. But here he's saying that these prisoners have never seen anything of themselves and one another. So you imagine a line of them in chairs, let's just say 10 to make it simple. If they're truly fettered with their heads facing forward, then they won't be able to look left or right. So the person in the middle will have several people on his left and several people on his right, but he won't know that there are people there. In fact, his ignorance of his situation is so deep that he not only doesn't know the people on his left and the people on his right, that they're there, he doesn't even know that he has a body himself in that particular place because his head can't move. He can't look down at his lap or at his legs or at his arms. Again, not plausible, not realistic, impossible, but we can imagine it. So each of these prisoners is ignorant of his or her actual physical location and situation and, and predicament, but because there are images projected on the wall in front of each of them, they confuse those images with themselves. So if we imagine someone right in the middle, uh, person number five in that uh, sequence of 10 people, he's not aware of his own body as person number five in a sequence of 10 people who are fettered into chairs, but he watches a show and the puppeteers have probably, we can imagine, chosen one statue in particular that they parade and uh, project an image of and speak in a way that corresponds with him, so that he thinks that that shadow or that image on the wall in front of him, that that's who he is. And similarly, person number four and person number six, he thinks that uh, the shadows that the puppeteers have chosen to represent those people, that those shadows are indeed person number four and person number six. So for any particular person, he's not aware of himself bodily, nor of his neighbors bodily, but the puppeteers have cleverly tricked him into believing that the shadows that correspond to each of their bodies is in fact who they are. This is a very deep point that would take a long time to explain precisely what it means for Plato, but for now it's sufficient to say that these people are confused about who they are. They don't know who they themselves are. No particular person knows who he himself is, and he doesn't know who other people really are. He takes the illusions of himself and of his neighbors to be realities. And remember, those illusions are created by these puppeteers whose motives are not yet clear, if, if they ever become clear in this allegory. And so the confusion he has about himself and other people um, is serving some purpose that he's not aware of because he's not even aware that those are illusions. So going on, Glaucon says, in response to this claim that they're unaware of themselves and one another, except by the shadows that the fire casts on the wall uh, of the cave in front of them. Glaucon says, how could they if they have to keep their heads motionless throughout life? Socrates then says, what about the things carried along the wall? Isn't the same true where they are concerned? For example, when an animal statue is paraded, an animal image appears on the wall, and it's not that the prisoner thinks, oh, there's an animal statue with its image projected. Rather, he thinks there's an animal. Again, the world of images on the cave wall in front of them, the prisoner takes to be the real world. The fundamental confusion here in this allegory, and Plato thinks in human life, is that the prisoners, and thus us, because remember, they're like us, the fundamental confusion uh, that we are susceptible to is that we confuse images of things with what they really are. Glaucon says, of course, Socrates, and if they could engage in discussion with one another, don't you think that they would assume that the words they used apply to the things they see passing in front of them? So if our person number five that we imagined earlier says tree, 
he assumes that that word applies to the image of a tree that's in front of him. And again, he doesn't think to himself, my word tree applies to the image that's passing in front of him. He thinks the word tree applies to trees. But his mistake is that he thinks that the images of trees that pass in front of him are indeed trees. Whereas it would be more accurate to say that the word tree that he's using applies to this statue thing that's being used by the prisoners, uh, excuse me, by the puppeteers to project an image of tree for uh, him and his fellow prisoners. At any rate, that would be the source of the image. More on that later. So what about the things carried along the wall? Isn't the same true where they're concerned, of course? Okay. And if they could engage in discussions with one another, don't you think they would assume that the words they used apply to the things they see passing in front of them? So there we go again. Glaucon says they would have to. Glaucon recognizes they have no alternative. That's their only reality. Socrates replies, what if their prison also had an echo from the wall facing them? When one of the carriers passing along the wall spoke, do you think they would believe that anything other than the shadow passing in front of them was speaking? And that's just to illustrate uh, what I've already said. Glaucon replies, I do not by Zeus. Socrates, all in all then, what the prisoners would take for true reality is nothing other than the shadows of those artifacts. I, I think that's, we've explained that. So Glaucon then says, that's entirely inevitable. Socrates now pivots and goes deeper. Consider then what being released from their bonds and cured of their foolishness would naturally be like. So imagine it. Imagine somebody trapped for years, decades in that situation, thinking that images of statues are real and then being freed, turning around, literally pivoting, as I mentioned earlier. What's that going to be like for such a person? And remember, back to the beginning, the first line, which I'll read again. Next then, compare the effect of education and that of the lack of it on our nature to an experience like this. So the experience is changing now. It's not just being trapped at the bottom of the cave. It's also being liberated from the cave. And this entire story is to say something about education, or the lack of it, on our nature. So this is the first moment of education in Plato's story, being liberated from this cave. Although we're not yet clear on what that means for us, because this is still a story. But he's saying, imagine if they were cured of their foolishness. Uh, what would it be like if something like this should happen to them? When one was freed and suddenly compelled to stand up, turn his neck around, walk, and look up toward the light, he would be pained by doing all of these things. I mean, imagine the pain. It's hard enough when you've been sitting still, reading a book for several hours, or watching, binging, uh, episodes on Netflix, and then you move for the first time in hours, how painful it can be, your whole life in one position. And again, it's an allegory, but Plato's here signaling about education that it's going to require uncharacteristic movements, less of your body, although that is important in Platonic philosophy, but more so of your soul, and that those new movements are going to be very painful, very different from what you're accustomed to, they're going to be sore. At any rate, this person who has to do all this standing up, turning, walking, looking toward the light. He should be pained. Now, not only will he be pained by the bodily movements, his eyes are also going to be pained because he's used to looking at dim shadows on a wall. Now he has to turn and look at the light of the fire. And you've all had that experience in a movie theater where you're enjoying the shadows or images on the screen. You turn around and you see the projector and it hurts your eyes. And it's also a way of breaking the illusion of the film. You think for a moment, this is just a film. If you'd been caught up in the drama, if you turn and see the projector by chance, uh, you distance yourself from the experience of the film as real. And that's good in this case, in this allegory of the cave, because that's education. You begin, the prisoner begins, I should say, to see that the images on the wall are merely images. They're not, in fact, real. So the beginning of education for Plato here literally in the allegory, but also in real life, is painful. So he would be pained by doing all these things and be unable to see the things whose shadows he had seen before. So he turns around and he looks at the statues that are being paraded above that wall in front of the fire, and he can't see them. He's just used to looking at images. 
So looking at something more real, and it's hard to think of a statue as real, but relative to an image of a statue, it's more real. So it's turning and becoming uh, acquainted with something at least more real, the thing of which the image was a projection, and it's hard to see it. Education is hard because the objects to which you turn, which are more real, are not going to be clear at first. You have to learn how to see them, even though in, in, their, in themselves they're more visible because they're more real in the allegory. You'd be unable to see the things whose shadows he had seen before because of the flashing lights, the fire that is. What do you think he would say if we told him that what he had seen before was silly nonsense, but that now, because he is a bit closer to what is, and I should just make a comment about the Greek, what is is the Greek idiom for uh, the real, or we would say in English, reality. Uh, that's a Latin derivative, but the Greeks had this phrase, what is, uh, for real. It's not that they had a direct translation of reality and they're not using it here. It's, that's the way a Greek of this period said reality. Uh, Plato writes, what is, as opposed to what seems. So he's turning this prisoner from what appears, namely the image, towards what is the statue of the tree or the animal or the, or the human being. And we, uh, he's saying, imagine us telling him, now you're seeing something more real. You're a bit closer to what is. How is he going to treat that uh, revelation, especially when we say this so-called reality, this appearance of reality that, with which you've been familiar for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, however long, it's silly nonsense. Uh, try, try that someday. Well, actually, don't try this at home. Don't try to say to somebody, by the way, everything you've believed about life is entirely wrong. It's all silly nonsense. That doesn't end well. And Plato's here comparing that to the effect of education on our nature. Namely, we are not the kind of beings inclined, even when it's true, we are not inclined to um, receive the news that everything that we believe to this point is false. We are not inclined to receive that news happily. Instead, uh, we grow angry, which is what he's about to say. So uh, if we were to tell him that it's all silly nonsense, but that now, because he is a bit closer to what is and is turned towards things that are more, that is more real, he sees more correctly. How's he going to receive that news? And in particular, if we pointed to each of the things passing by and compelled him to answer what each of them is, if we gave him a quiz about the statues, how well is he going to do on that quiz? Poorly. Whereas if he's been for decades viewing the images on the cave wall, he's going to be good by now at identifying those images for what they seem to be, or he would think, for what they are. So whereas he's successful in his world of images, he's going to be foolish. He's going to stumble in the uh, quiz, the investigation about these statues, which are closer to reality. So there's going to be an, an emotive for him to turn back because he knows how to succeed in that image world, whereas here he fails, even though he's coming closer to reality. Again, a lesson about education, that as you turn towards what's more real, you have to give up the success that you've had in a realm of images and thus be courageous enough to uh, accept the uncertainty and the, the wound to your vanity that being acquainted with things more real for the first time is going to cause because you're not going to know your way around them. And in particular, if we pointed each of the things passing by and compelled him to answer what each of them is, don't you think he would be puzzled and believe that the things he saw earlier were more truly real than the ones he was being shown. Well, uh, let me come out of left field and anticipate something that Plato believes that will seem wild uh, without much context, but it'll give you an idea of what he has in mind. Uh, imagine if I were to say to you the, um, you know, the physical things in front of you, the table, the chair uh, on which you're sitting, the computer on which you're listening, uh, etc., that these are not real things, that these are shadows of, let's say, numbers. Imagine numbers are the real things and the you know two cups on your desk, that those are not real, those are shadows of the number two. Uh, you might think, that's crazy talk. You look at these two cups, I can see them, I can touch them, I can drink tea from them, 
Uh, and these number, the number two that you're telling me is more real, show it to me. I can't see it. I can't hear it. I can't smell it and so on. Uh, that would seem crazy. And that's the kind of craziness that Plato is anticipating here, that with this student, this prisoner, when uh, he's informed that the images that he's been watching his entire life and thinking to be real, when he's informed that those are not real, but instead by turning and looking towards the fire, which he can barely uh, appreciate with his eyes, which are dazzled, he's turning towards things which are more real, things he can't even yet see, he's not going to receive that well. He's not going to understand it. And even if he did, he's not going to agree uh, because it's going to be so emotionally uh, disorienting. Glaucon says, much more so. So Socrates then replies, and if he were compelled to look at the light itself, wouldn't his eyes be pained? And wouldn't he turn around and flee toward the things he is able to see and believe that they are really clearer than the ones he is being shown? This is a perennial difficulty with education, Plato's indicating here, that when a lesson begins to reveal itself to a student, and a student, a listener in this case, myself, as I go deeper into the philosophical life, that when a lesson reveals itself to us, we get a glimpse of something else uh, which we're not accustomed. And it may in fact be more real, but because it's so disorienting for so many reasons, it's easier for us to turn back to what we know, with that with which we're familiar. We don't actually know it, it turns out, for Plato, but that with which we're familiar. And again, so many reasons that the confusion, uh, the fear, uh, the anger, certainly, and he'll get into that in a moment, at the teacher who put us in that disorienting situation. And I encounter this problem all the time as a philosophy instructor, that um, I can see students beginning to see uh, doubts, beginning to feel doubts about things they've taken for granted their entire lives. And instead of investigating those doubts, letting go completely of uh, what they've assumed to be true, instead becoming uh, afraid and then angry uh, at the teacher sometimes for putting them in that situation. And it manifests in silly ways about grades and so on. But I've seen it uh, the other way too. I've seen a student years ago who had been a devout uh, Christian and on reading an argument and discussing in class an argument against the existence of God that she couldn't deny, went, I saw her go through these stages of doubt and confusion and fear, and then anger, not at me in this case or at the author of this article, but anger at the tradition in which she'd been raised. So there's a lot at stake in philosophical questions because when it comes to what's real and what's merely an image, uh, your life pivots, again, to use that term, that applies to the physical conditions of this allegory. The direction in which you face uh, is determined by what you think to be real. And Plato's aware, not just of the stakes, but also of the difficulty of turning in the right direction because of how unfamiliar that makes your life. Let me get back to the text. Glaucon agrees that he's not, the prisoner's not likely to do this uh, willingly. And so Socrates says, and if someone dragged him by force, now there's the, the uh, old fashioned teacher who's going to make the student learn the lesson, uh, regardless of whether or not uh, she wants to learn the lesson, regardless of whether or not she's comfortable learning that lesson. This is a forceful teacher, Socrates imagines, who drags the prisoner, who, remember, the prisoner is wanting to turn back and look at the images. Socrates imagining a teacher, a liberator, coming and dragging that prisoner away. And from the outside, we can say, well, good for that liberator. After all, it would be a mistake for that prisoner to remain at the bottom of the cave simply because that's what seems comfortable. She'll be much happier, won't she, once she's liberated from the cave, even if for now it's unfamiliar. Well, that's not always clear, but at any rate, He's imagining it. And if someone dragged him by force away from there, along the rough, steep, upward path, and did not let him go until he had dragged him into the light of the sun. So now this prisoner has been liberated, not just by turning away from the wall with its shadow play, 
We're imagining this liberator dragging this student, former prisoner, past the fire, up the path, out into the light of the sun. Wouldn't he be pained and angry at being treated that way? And so here the pain is much more intense because the unfamiliarity is not just with statues, but with the real things, which are going to be massive in some cases as compared with the statues. A tiny little statue tree was projected onto a wall. Now a huge tree is outside the cave, and the sun, so much brighter than the fire, is going to literally hurt the eyes of the prisoner, the former prisoner. But the anger is going to also be, of course, at the violation of the freedom of the student who has been forced uh, from the cave. So there's a whole mix of feelings, anger at having surrendered what was familiar, anger at the teacher for forcing, pain at the light of the sun, um, hurting the eyes, and so on. And when he came into the light, wouldn't he have his eyes filled with sunlight and be able to see a single one of the things now said to be truly real? His ability to see is ability to see is completely gone now. He, he's, his eyes are completely overwhelmed. He can't see anything. And yet he's being told by the teacher, these are the truly real things. And the teacher's right. These are, well, at least within the allegory, these are the truly real things. And yet this poor student can't see them at all. Again, uh, a difficult problem in education where you, as a teacher, know something to be true, but in order to get the student to see what's true, you have to point the student towards something the student can't see, and that it will take time for the student to adjust. Um, that's why it's hard as a teacher to only have students for a short time. It takes months, years for students to adjust, even to simple truths. And this story is a good indication of that, how taking someone out of the cave, it's going to take time for their eyes to adjust and see something so straightforward as a tree. Glaucon says, no, he would not be able to, at least not right away. Socrates replies, he would need time to get adjusted, I suppose, if he is going to see the things in the world above. At first, he would see shadows most easily, then images of men and other things in water, then the things themselves. So there's going to be stages. From these, it would be easier for him to go on to look at the things in the sky and the sky itself at night gazing at the light of the sun and the moon, then during the day gazing at the sun and the light of the sun, of course. So by stages, he becomes accustomed to what we call the outside world, the world outside of the cave. And if you know anything about Plato, uh, and even if you don't, I'd like to highlight here a difficulty. It's a difficulty in talking about this allegory, because if we simply just tell the story, it's straightforward enough. This prisoner has been liberated. Now he's in what we call the real world as opposed to the world of the cave. But for Plato, what we call the real world, the world of the table and the chair and the cups that I mentioned earlier, that's not the real world. So when that prisoner in the allegory is liberated from the shadowy cave and out into the light of the sun and in the allegory is said to have reached the real world, actually, Plato thinks that's not the real world. The physical world is itself a shadow of the real world, not unlike the world I described earlier of the cups and the chair and the table and so on being shadows of numbers uh, and weird things in Platonic philosophy called forms, which we're not going to get into today. But now, recognizing that, the cave becomes oh, fractal. There are many, many layers to it. And so... Oh, I, I hardly know what to let. Let me go on then. <laughs> Socrates says, finally, I suppose he would be able to see the sun, not reflections of it in water or some alien place, but the sun just by itself in its own place and be able to look at it and see what it is like. So this sounds almost like sun worship, uh, if we took the allegory literally. But since this is an allegory and indicates what Plato thinks really happens in our lives, we're born into caves of a sort, that is to say, worlds of illusion. And we take those illusions to be real unless we're fortunate enough to have a good education. Remember, this is about the effective education, the lack of it on our nature. 
And education is going to be something like liberation from the illusions into which we're born, the social conventions especially, uh, that our parents, if we're lucky, give us. Um, we need those social conventions to reach certain stages of maturity, but that if we continue to accept those conventions uncritically, uh, we then become trapped in a world of illusions. If we're fortunate to receive the kind of education Plato's imagining or prescribing here in this dialogue, we become liberated from those social conventions, those conventions about what's good, what's bad, what's right, what's wrong, what's virtuous, what's vicious. And we turn away from the darkness and the shadows of those social projections. Now, the puppeteers here are, well, a host of people, the, the people who give children, then teenagers, and then ultimately adults as well, ideas about what life is like. So first parents, in, in many cases, or at least caregivers, uh, teachers, priests, uh, pastors, rabbis, and so on, therapists, uh, the media, friends, of course, who cooperate in these ways of thinking. This is a kind of education. This is uh, as it, what I'm calling social convention. This is a way for a, an infant to acquire the ability to function with other human beings in the non-human world as well, the physical world. But unless those conventions are entirely correct, uh, there are going to be illusions among them. And that so-called education that people receive all over the world to, throughout history uh, is going to be insufficient because there's never been a society that's been right about everything. To get a real education, Plato's saying, would require this kind of liberator who would shake the student from the fetters and quote, turn the student around. And what that means is turn the student towards something more real, away from what he argues elsewhere are the illusions of physical objects, uh, away from the senses that trick us into thinking that those things are truly real, away from social conventions and the many ways in which we absorb those through, as I say, media, through stories, through imaginative tales such as this one which is why Plato's telling an imaginative tale. He knows that he can't get students by making abstract arguments about numbers. He has to tell a story. And that this story, however, is different from other stories because whereas the other stories trap people in uh, illusions, this story is going to give them a sense that there is more to life and the world than what they've been told. So back to this sun worship that I mentioned, this student who comes out of this cave, this prisoner that comes out of this cave, I'm mixing the layers together. The prisoner comes out of the cave, the student comes out of the illusions and the real objects that the student sees after having been disabused of the illusions that physical things are real, that social conventions are totally reliable guides to how you should live your life, this student will instead of relying on those appearances, think directly instead of realities. So rather than accepting that what American society or some subculture within American society says to be just is just, the student of Platonic philosophy, someone who's received this kind of education, will begin, ideally with a teacher, in dialogue, to investigate what is justice really? Do the conventions that I've been raised with stand up to critical scrutiny? What about the conventions of other societies or other subcultures? What do they have to offer? How do these definitions fit together in such a way that a coherent account of what's really just could be established? That's the kind of education Plato's imagining, and that it will if it's taken all the way, and Plato thinks it will take 50 years, <laughs> he actually lays out the number of years each stage will take, but we don't need to take it too literally. It'll take a really long time, he thinks, before someone comes to a point where they are seeing 
not simply the things that are real, like the trees and the pond and so on outside the cave, but this student will see what gives light to the trees and the pond. And that's the sun in the allegory. And in Plato's philosophy, that's what he calls the good, which is a strange term. Uh, Greeks could take adjectives like good, uh, this is good tea, and could turn them into nouns by putting a definite article in front. So instead of good tea, you take good and just put the in front of it, you get the good. And here you have, in Plato's idiom, not just uh, good tea, not just good honey, not just a good book, not just a, a good microphone, but the thing that makes all of those various goodnesses good. And Plato thinks that only when you're familiar with that, only when you have some kind of special relationship with that, which I think is ultimately a kind of identity, uh, assimilation of it, will you live a truly good life. Now, as I say, that's a strange thing, the good. We have uh, to hand in modern languages something rather like what he's talking about. And we have to be careful here because there are differences. But God is the word that we use in English, and of course, equivalents in other languages, that's closest to what Plato has in mind when he says the good. And again, let's be careful. Uh, Plato's good is not doesn't have a personality. There aren't stories where it gets angry and takes vengeance on whole towns in the Middle East and so on. Um, but if we think of something of supreme power that is responsible for uh, the ordering of the world and that um, not until we have this kind of special relationship with this thing could we ever be satisfied, that's what he has in mind. And again, um, I guess perhaps I'm introducing too much from outside the allegory. Uh, I guess I'm trying to explain why he's talking so much about the sun here. Uh, and to people who are hostile to religion, uh, or at least indifferent to it, this will all seem irrelevant. Perhaps the story might have been interesting up to this point. Um, Plato has reasons uh, for believing these things uh, that he expresses elsewhere in this very dialogue and in other dialogues. Uh, but, you know, we don't need to get into them, certainly not for this introductory discussion for this podcast. But it's worth remembering that, that that's where this is going, that this prisoner trapped in that cave is being liberated, not just so that he can see the sun uh, or whatever that's supposed to mean, but so that this person can live a, a satisfying life. This person can live a good life. This person can be happy. Plato thinks that in the allegory, only by seeing the source of all light uh, is that possible. So let's get back to the story. Glaucon says he would have to see the sun, that is. Socrates says, after that, he would already be able to conclude about it, that it provides the seasons and the years, governs everything in the visible world, and is in some way the cause of all the things that he and his fellows used to see. Remember, what he and his fellows used to see were images on a cave wall, and in this case, now that he's been liberated completely and he sees the sun, he can trace back. He can, he's, he's traveled up to the sun from the bottom of this cave. Now in his mind, he can trace back a causal connection between the sun, which gives life to the tree uh, and is cut down to make wood that then can make a statue of a tree that the puppeteers hold up in front of the fire, the fire which burns wood, which is ultimately caused, uh, it brought into being, sustained by the sun, and the fire casts a light that's a pale image itself of the sun, uh, creating an image of the tree on the cave wall. Again, this is allegorical, but Plato thinks that when you have this experience, when you have this recognition of God, or the good, that having worked for so many years to climb up to that recognition or experience or identification, assimilation, whatever it is, you can then travel back down first in your mind and sort of see how things fit together, but also uh, travel back down Well, in the allegory of the cave, go back into the cave to liberate other people uh, or in real life, as we would call it, 
Uh, you're not going back down into caves, but you're going to be doing good. Now, doing good not according to social conventions, which are sometimes and maybe even often wrong, but according to what's really good. And Glaucon says that would clearly be his next step. Socrates. What about when he reminds himself of his first dwelling place, what passed for wisdom there and his fellow prisoners? Don't you think he would count himself happy for the change and pity the others? So this is supposed to be a happy ending where the prisoner or the student has been dragged up and shown the world outside the cave or the real world it forms, numbers, the good, and so on. This student now is happy and satisfied that that was worth it, overcome the anger and the fear and the doubts from earlier on. When he looks back on his previous life, thinks, that was a dark, dank cave. I'm glad I'm out of there. Or the student who has seen what life is really like. Thank you, teacher, for showing me that this element of my upbringing, uh, or many elements, maybe all of it, was false. Right? That rarely happens. But here, Plato's imagining a happy ending to the story of education. Glaucon says, certainly, Socrates. And if there had been honors, praises, or prizes among them down in the cave, for the one who was sharpest at identifying the shadows as they passed by, and was best able to remember which usually came earlier, which later, and which simultaneously, and who was thus best able to prophesize the future, do you think that our man would desire these rewards or envy those among the prisoners who were honored and held power? So down in that cave where images are taken for reality, some of those prisoners are going to be good at predicting those images and naming them and seeing how the images are related to one another. And the other prisoners are going to reward that person and praise that person, give that person so-called political office, or at least a shadow of political office. And this liberated person looking down at those honors and praise, I mean, physically looking down into the cave, will no longer desire those things. We'll see that as a shadow of honor, a shadow of political office, so-called esteem and prestige. This is the liberation of the philosopher, the, the lover of wisdom, the student who has achieved uh, enough wisdom to be able to look down into this shadow world. This is the liberation of the philosopher, not so much from the physical world sensation and so on, but from the temptation to live uh, for, the, uh, by, for the praise of others and to avoid the disapproval of others. And how many of us can say that we're indifferent to the praise and disapproval of others? I think most of us, most of the time, care a lot about that. And Plato thinks here, encoded in the story, that only when you have been liberated from the mistaken view that the things being praised or disapproved of are real, are you actually free to look down on those praises and act according to what's really good, or at least what you think to be really good, rather than what others think to be good and bad. Or do you think he, Socrates resumes, would feel with Homer that he would much prefer to work the earth as a serf for another man, a man without possessions of his own? This is a reference, as he says, to Homer uh, and to the Odyssey. Let me just tell a little story. When Odysseus is traveling back from the Trojan War, uh, this long campaign to return home, one of the things he has to do is summon the spirits of the dead through a pool of blood and speak to them. And he summons some of the heroes from the what we know as the Iliad, from the Trojan War. And one of them is Achilles, the greatest of all the Greek warriors. And when Achilles rises from under the ground, so to speak, to the surface of the pool of blood and, and can speak to Odysseus, who's staring down into that pool. Odysseus asks him, what's it like down there, the life after? And Achilles says, I'll repeat, I would rather work the earth as a slave or a serf for another man, a man without possessions of his own. Then, he goes on to say in the original be king over all the dead. Achilles is saying, life in the underworld, life after life, 
is so bad that it's better to be a slave, to be the worst of all human beings, be in the worst of all conditions anyway, in human life. It's better to be in the worst of all conditions there than it is to be king over all the dead. And that's from Achilles, who, if anybody would have achieved that position, it would be him. And so let me repeat the sentence from Plato now, Socrates speaking. Or do you think he, this is he, the student who's been liberated from the cave, the philosopher, the the one who's been trained to see what's really good and to become indifferent to honors, praises, money, and so on. Do you think he would feel with Homer that he would much prefer to work the earth as a serf for another man, a man without possession of his own, and go through any sufferings rather than share their beliefs and live as they do? So there's a lot going on here. We've got the allegory, we've got what Plato thinks it really means, and now we've got this little Homeric comment uh, that's being sucked into the story. And just to make it clear, if it isn't already, Socrates is saying that these people in the cave, this underworld, like Achilles, these people who are like us, who care about the praise of other people, who care about the disapproval of other people, who care about predicting the images and how they're associated so that we can make more money, the typical preoccupations of human life, when looked at from above, it is like... Uh, it's like the afterlife, uh, which is so dismal, according to Achilles, that you would rather be a slave in the world above. In other words, that real world that seems so strange to people who are not familiar with Plato or don't believe what Plato says about what reality is like, numbers, forms, etc. That world, that strange world, it would be better to be a slave there than to be king over all the dead, where the dead in this story now are us. We are in the underworld. As I say, the story starts to have many, many layers as you as you go on with it. And as I say, diagrams make this a lot easier, and I'm doing my best with just my voice. Glaucon says, yes, I think he would rather suffer anything than live like that. The liberated prisoner would rather suffer anything than have to go back down and care about the stuff that people at the bottom of the cave care about. Socrates, consider this too then. If this man went back down into the cave and sat down in the same seat, wouldn't his eyes be filled with darkness coming suddenly out of the sun like that? So let's imagine he does go back down, Socrates is saying. And uh, there's a question of why he would go back down, and I think uh, a motive of, of... of help, of wanting to help those at the bottom to liberate them is his motive. Uh, there's a, a notion, a belief in Buddhism of the bodhisattva who is returning to a bodily incarnation in order to help others um, liberate themselves from that. And I think that's rather like the idea here. So this philosopher uh, is going to go back down into the cave Uh, is going to return to the life of politics, of power, of honors, praises, prestige, money-making, and so on, what most people take to be a good life, a fulfilling life. And when he's in that life, after having been out of it and seen what's real, it's going to be like returning into a cave after having been in the sun. He's not going to be able to identify the images any longer. He's barely going to be able to see them. So whereas before when he turned away from the images and he couldn't see because it was too bright, now having become accustomed to the world above, the sunlight, when he returns to the cave, he can't see again, but for the opposite reason. Now he's gone from the light into the dark. Glaucon says, certainly that's going to be the problem. Socrates, now, if he had to compete once again with the perpetual prisoners in recognizing the shadows while his sight was still dim and before his eyes had recovered, and if the time required for readjustment was not short, wouldn't he provoke ridicule? This is Plato's way of saying the true philosopher is going to be ridiculed. He's not going to seem wise to most people because he's going to be disoriented. He's not going to care about the things that they care about. He cares about other things that to them make no sense. If he were to go back into the cave and say, I want to tell you about real things, they would say, we already know about real things. Look in front of you. We can see them. And when he says, no, those are not real, he seems ridiculous. Socrates continues, "Wouldn't wouldn't it be said of him that he had returned from his upward journey with his eyes ruined? 
imagine this philosopher goes away for many years into the desert or to an institute or whatever, and he comes back to his old friends, to his family members, to his small town, and he says things like I just mentioned. They would say, this education ruined you. This time in the desert spoiled your mind. Socrates continues, and that it is not worthwhile even to try to travel upward. In other words, having been blessed with someone returning to help them, they will see this person as having been ruined and a confirmation of their prejudice that there is no point in getting an education of that sort. Because look, your mind gets ruined. This philosopher, as he calls himself, is a great example of why we live the best life by content with what we have. Socrates again. And as for anyone who tried to free the prisoners and lead them upward, if they could somehow get their hands on him, what do you think they're going to do? Socrates continues, wouldn't they kill him? Socrates, uh, Plato, excuse me, uh, Socrates' student, is writing this dialogue approximately 25 years or so after Socrates died. And many of you will know, some of you may not, that uh, Socrates was executed. Socrates, this character, was a real person, and he uh, wandered the city at a certain point in his life and asked difficult questions of the Athenians, questions that Plato records, like, what is justice? And he would ask people who thought they knew what that was, people who built careers uh, on the reputation that they knew what justice was. And they got angry because he was very good at exposing that, although they thought they knew what, say, justice was, they didn't, in fact, know what it was. So he spoiled some reputations. He stung the vanity of important Athenians. And for complicated reasons that we don't have time to get into now, uh, they killed him. Well, they had a trial for impiety and corrupting the youth, accusing Socrates of both those charges. And although, if Plato's apology is accurate, Socrates defends himself quite well against those charges, he's nonetheless uh, convicted. And then when the sentencing phase of the trial uh, happens, he's uh, condemned to death. And the way Athenian citizens were killed was not by the execution at another's hand, but rather the invitation to drink a poison called hemlock, which Socrates did and Plato portrays in a dialogue called the Phaedo. The dialogue that uh, describes his trial is called the Apology, where <laughs> Socrates is doing anything but apologizing. Apologia in Greek means defense. It's his defense speech. And so Plato here, as I say, writing a generation after those events, has Socrates, the character, say, well, if a teacher were to come down into the cave and to try to liberate those people, what would they do? They would kill him. I should add that in the Apology, Socrates tells the story of why he did that, why he went around the city and uh, gathered, not deliberately, but uh, by his account, just simply attracted many young men as he went about asking authorities what justice was, what courage was, what temperance was, what the various virtues were, to see if anyone was wiser than he. He did that because his friend, Chirophon, went to the temple of Apollo at Delphi. It'd be like for a Catholic going to Rome. It'd be uh, the center of um, divine prophecy. And Chirophon asked the priestess in this special ritual where the priestess would speak on behalf of Apollo. Chirophon asked, is there anyone wiser than Socrates? And the priestess said, no. So that was, message was delivered back to Socrates and in bad translations of the Apology, it says that he then went out to refute the god, which he would never have done uh, as a pious man, uh, or at least as he's depicted in Plato. As a pious man, he, and more accurately, the word is in Greek translated as he went out to investigate what the god could have meant by calling him or saying that no one was wiser than he. He didn't feel wise, but if the god was saying he was the wisest of all the Greeks, what could that possibly mean? So he went out and asked important questions about human life and living a good one of people who had reputations for wisdom. And after doing this for a while, he gathered that what the God meant by that 
Declaration was that although there were many people who thought they knew what wisdom was, what the virtues were, what the way the world really was, what a good life really was, and were wrong, Socrates was unique for knowing of those matters that he didn't know the right answers. This is often mistakenly said as Socrates knew that he knew nothing. That's not true. He knew a lot of things like how to put on his sandals and so on. But he knew of these really important things. What is justice? What is courage? How should you live your life? Um, He knew of those things that he didn't know the answers. And so humility was the lesson here that when it comes to divine matters, uh, he knew that as a human being, he didn't know the answer to those questions and to those divine matters, whereas mm, the other Athenian leaders were arrogant and thought that they did. So at any rate, back to this text, what would happen if somebody went down into the cave, they would kill him. This is Plato's saying of his teacher through the character Socrates in the dialogue Republic, that that was the story of Socrates' life, that he went back to Athens to try to educate them, first to investigate what the God meant, but then to help other people see that of the things they thought they knew, they didn't know, they could then acquire the wisdom that Socrates himself had, namely humility. The result was not universal education, but rather execution. And Glaucon, Plato's brother, says they certainly would. Now Socrates is going to tell us what this all means, and I hope you, know, you have an idea already, but let's see what he says to summarize. This image, remember, imagine, imagine, imagine here. The emphasis again is this is an image. This isn't wisdom. This isn't an argument, but this is a hint of what the life of wisdom is like, the love of wisdom, namely philosophy. Socrates says, this image, my dear Glaucon, must be fitted together as a whole with what we said before. Now here he's referring to book six. Um, which we haven't read or discussed. The realm revealed through sight should be likened to the prison dwelling. So what you take to be real, if you're a typical human being, namely the teacup and the desk and the chair and the computer and so on, the things you see, that's like the prison dwelling. These are merely images. And the light of the fire inside it to the sun's power. So... Here it gets confusing again. We can too easily conflate the allegory and what it's allegorizing. But a typical human being thinks the teacup, the desk, the microphone, the computer, the chair, these are real because we can see them. And what allows us to see? Ultimately, the light of the sun. But in the allegory, the sun is the very real thing. So we got to be careful not to confuse the sun of what we call real life with the sun of the allegory, which is the summit of what in fact, according to Plato, is real life. And if you think, Socrates continues, of the upward journey and the seeing of things above as the upward journey of the soul to the intelligible realm. And this is what I hinted at earlier with that allusion to numbers and, and forms that Plato argues elsewhere, but here only tells a story and speaks at this point rather dogmatically of a really real world that is inaccessible to our senses, that is not accurately represented by any social conventions, but is accessible only to our reason when it's been properly trained. You won't mistake my intention, Socrates says, since it is what you wanted to hear about. Now this next line is one I stumble over. I didn't even notice it for the first 20 years that I read this dialogue, and I must have read it 30 or 40 times by that point. Now it's one of the most memorable lines in the entire dialogue to me. So he's just summarized, well, he's told this story, and he's just summarized very quickly what it means, what the various stages of the cave mean, and he's alluded to his principal doctrine that real reality is intelligible but not sensible. He next says, only the God knows whether it is true. Only the God. There's Socrates' humility again. Although Socrates is expressing these doctrines with confidence in the sense that he's lived his life as if they're true, from what we learn in other Platonic dialogues as well as this one, 
He's not asserting that he knows. He's saying only the God knows whether it is true. So there's this kernel of faith in Plato that I myself struggle with because uh, so often Plato can seem different from the monotheistic religions. And I, I compared them earlier when I said the best approximation we have in everyday language to the good in Plato is God of the monotheistic religions. And I, I stand by that, although there are differences. The differences are important, however, because whereas the monotheistic religions, let's take Christianity, emphasize the importance of faith, in Platonism it's much more often reason, if not almost always reason, that's supposed to take us to the heights, not faith. And yet, here he says, only the God knows whether it is true. Moving on then. But this is how these phenomena seem to me. So Socrates is saying, from my investigations, this is Plato writing Socrates, from our collective philosophical investigations here in Athens over the last 50 years or 100 years, however we want to encompass this tradition by this point, Plato's saying, this is how it seems to me. Only the God knows whether it's true, but I, as a limited human being, have come to these conclusions, and I live my life accordingly. He says, in the knowable realm, the last thing to be seen is the form of the good, or simply the good that I mentioned earlier. And it is seen only with toil and trouble. I mentioned that if you count up the years, this education is supposed to take 50. Once one has seen it, however, one must infer that it is the cause of all that is correct and beautiful in anything. And remember in the allegory, once the prisoner has been liberated, has come out into the outside world, outside the cave, and has seen what we call real objects, looked up to the sun, the end of that upward journey then is the beginning of a downward journey, at least in the mind, if not physically. That liberated person can realize that the sun and the story is responsible for everything. So too, he's saying again, that once you've had this experience of the form of the good, you can see how it is responsible for everything. Once one has seen it, however, one must infer that it is the cause of all that is correct and beautiful, or at least the cause of everything that's good and beautiful, that in the visible realm it produces both light and its source, and in the intelligible realm it controls and provides truth and understanding, and that anyone who is to act sensibly in private or public must see it. Glaucon says, I agree so far as I am able. An important limitation on, well, Glaucon as a student of Socrates, confessing that he doesn't always follow what Socrates is saying, but I think Plato is saying on our behalf that Glaucon, a typical student, is accurate in representing the fact that he is going to have limits. So far as he's able, he agrees. Socrates says next, Come on, then, and join me in this further thought. You should not be surprised that the ones who get to this point are not willing to occupy themselves with human affairs, but that, on the contrary, their souls are always eager to spend their time above. I mean, that is surely what we would expect, if indeed the image I described before is also accurate. So let's step back. One doesn't have to accept Plato's metaphysics and beliefs about the good, 50-year education to get value out of this allegory. And that's deliberate. He's written in a way that you can get any number of things out of this without accepting the whole. Here's something that I want to um, relate about it. And I'm going to just read a bit more and give a commentary on that. And this interruption in the text, uh, there are several passages that I'm skipping over, and I want to finish this episode with a reading of these two paragraphs, short paragraphs. Socrates is summarizing uh, the allegory in its lesson, and he says, then here is how we must think about these matters, if that is true. Education, and let's remember, that's what this allegory was supposed to be about, the effect of education or the lack of it on our nature. Education, he says, is not what some people boastfully declare it to be. Think about what you've been told education is, maybe what you think education is. Socrates is implying that you're probably wrong. 
or at least that what you've been told is probably wrong. You've been told boastfully that it's something or other. He thinks it's not that. And what is it that it's not? They presumably say, he says, they can put knowledge into souls that lack it, as if they could put sight into blind eyes. Socrates is addressing a very fundamental misunderstanding about education, that what it is is taking somebody and putting stuff into them, information, knowledge, skills, etc. He doesn't think that's what education really is. doesn't mean that that's not valuable. He's not saying it's bad to have skills or to acquire information. That's fine. Remember, he can put on his sandals. <laughs> He's not totally ignorant. And um, those kinds of uh, things are good. But that's not what he's been talking about in this allegory. Really important to remember. He's talking about education in the fullest sense. And you don't even have to believe that it's the fullest sense. You can just think of it as this special thing and or this unique thing. And now the question is, what is it? If it's not taking somebody and putting stuff into them, what is it? And he says, you don't take blind eyes and stuff them with sight. It's just not possible. You do something else with blind eyes if the person's going to see. That's what education would be. So he goes on. Glaucon says, yes, they do say that. They do think of education as putting stuff into the soul or into the mind or into the character or the nature or whatever. That's what people typically think education is. Socrates now goes on in the second of these two paragraphs with which I want to conclude. But here is what our present account shows about this power to learn that is present in everyone's soul. And the instrument with which each of us learns, just as an eye cannot be turned around from darkness to light except by turning the whole body, so this instrument must be turned around from what comes to be, together with the whole soul, until it is able to bear to look at what is, and at the brightest thing that is, the one we call the good. Isn't that right? So if somebody can't see, it's because they're in the dark, you don't take sight and stuff it into the eye. That's his analogy. What you do is you turn them around so that they can face the light and start seeing. And this is, of course, an allusion to those poor prisoners who thought they could see but weren't seeing in the fullest sense because they were watching shadows and not watching things that are real, illuminated by the light of the sun. Similarly, you don't take somebody's reason, if you want to properly fully educate them at any rate, and stuff their minds with information, rather you turn their soul around, you turn the reason around so that it's pointed towards the thing that gives light. So I guess I said that you could get this lesson without believing in Plato's metaphysics and his views of the good, and I, I guess I was wrong about that. No, in fact, that's exactly what he's saying, that this kind of education that he's talking about, the real kind, not the kind that's predicting what happens on the cave wall and knowing which images come after which and becoming honored among your fellow citizens for being good at that or making money because you can predict what's going to happen on the stock market and so on. No, this education is turning around. So just as we saw in the allegory, the eye has to turn around to see a brighter light, a truer light. And in order to do that, the whole body has to be turned around. If the body's fettered facing in the wrong direction, there can be no true seeing. The body has to be liberated. The body has to be turned around, whether of its own volition or by another liberator. Correlatively, with the soul, if reason is that which sees what's there to be seen or understood, here we're talking about intelligible things and not visible things, it's, it's not sufficient to stuff reason with knowledge. What has to be done is reason has to be turned towards the kind of light, analogously speaking, whatever it is that shines light on intelligible things and makes them intelligible or understandable, reason has to be turned in that direction. 
But just as you can't turn an eye without turning the whole body, so too you cannot turn reason without turning the whole soul. Now, this alludes to other passages in the Republic about the way the soul is constituted, the way that human nature works. Just very quickly, Plato thinks that there are roughly three parts of our soul. Reason is the uppermost, but below it is a part of us that craves respect, dignity, esteem by cooperating with social conventions. And uh, the lowest part are bodily appetites, which uh, work with perceptions of physical things to acquire bodily satisfaction. And our character is how we are constituted, how our appetites, our craving for esteem, and our reason work together, which of those three parts sets the agenda for our soul or our life, if you will, which is in power and makes the other parts cooperate with what it desires. And if reason is a slave to the passions, as the philosopher David Hume says, if reason has to cooperate with the desire of our craving for respect or the desire of our bodily appetites, which seek above all things money because that can buy bodily satisfactions. If reason is the slave of the passions, there can't be any real education. Rather, our craving for respect, our craving for uh, material things and money, those have to be the slaves of reason. And so real education, its goal should be pointing reason towards that which illuminates the intelligible realm, which in Plato's understanding is the good, but that that can happen until first the whole character turns around. And that's why in Platonic education, the student must begin with character training. The teacher must begin with character training of the student, which is going to be the formation of bodily appetites, or at least the shaping of bodily appetites and the um, correcting of the craving for esteem so that it's oriented towards the esteem of people who are really good, not until the student has been constituted, until the student has been trained or shaped or formed so that those two inferior parts of the soul obey, follow, reason. Will reason be pointed in the right direction? And Plato's confident that once reason is pointed in the right direction, uh, learning comes very quickly. Right? Not so much the learning of the kind of knowledge we spoke about earlier, the acquisition of information, but that the absorption of true value so that human life can be oriented towards that which is really good, not merely that which seems to be good. That orientation, um, those lessons are absorbed quickly because because it is pointed in the right direction and now life can be lived properly and the student can live a fulfilling meaningful happy life that's the point of platonic education 